Good afternoon. Oh no, we have to. Can we do this, Dr. Abowski way? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, members of the UMBC faculty and student community, alumni and friends. I'd like to welcome you to today's special event, the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Lecture. My name is Anna Shields, and I'm the Associate Professor of Chinese in the Department of Modern Languages, Linguistics, and Intercultural Communication. And I'm also president of the ETA chapter of Phi Beta Kappa here at UMBC. We are delighted to welcome you to hear our distinguished speaker, Professor David Shambaugh, who is Professor of Political Science and International Affairs, as well as Director of the China Policy Program at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. I'm going to introduce Professor Shambaugh more fully in, in a second, but let me first say a few words about Phi Beta Kappa and the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Program that brings him to our campus. As the nation's <coughs> oldest academic honor society, founded in 1776, Phi Beta Kappa was founded on the principles of freedom of inquiry and liberty of thought and expression, and it celebrates and advocates excellence in the liberal arts and sciences. There are only 280 chapters of Phi Beta Kappa at the many colleges and universities of the United States, and obtaining a chapter requires demonstrating not only the presence of outstanding students, but also an institution's deep commitment to a liberal arts education. UMBC was granted the charter for our chapter, ETA of Maryland, in 97, after several years of dedicated effort on the part of many UMBC faculty members and administrators, and we elected the first members from the graduating class of 1998. We are one of the youngest institutions to receive that honor. Every year, the Phi Beta Kappa, Phi Beta Kappa membership of our chapter reviews and elects a group of students, once in fall and once in spring. And this year's fall induction ceremony, at which we welcomed nine outstanding students to membership, was held yesterday in a very happy ceremony attended by Phi Beta Kappa members and the student's family and friends. Today, we are equally delighted to welcome Professor Shambaugh, who's participating in the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Program. The Visiting Scholar Program was founded in 1956 to enrich the intellectual life of campuses all across the United States. This year, in a wonderful example of our typical UMBC synergy, we bring Professor Shambaugh to campus with the support of many academic interests on campus. Not only is he the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar, but he is a speaker in UMBC's Social Sciences Forum, and also the second speaker in the Asian Studies Lecture Series. I am especially grateful for the support of the Asian Studies Program and for the efforts of its director, Dr. Constantine Paporas. This year marks the inaugural year of the Asian Studies Program at UMBC, and Professor Shambaugh's lecture will be followed in the spring by two more, study, uh, two more lectures in the program from Professor Martin Colcutt of Princeton University and Professor uh, Minalini Sinha from Penn State. With additional support for Professor Shambaugh's visit from the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, the Department of Political Science, and the Honors College, I think we can truly say that the commitment to bringing him to campus embodies the spirit of liberal education here at UMBC. So on behalf of the ETA chapter, I would like to thank all of these partners for their help in making this event happen. Now I'd like to introduce our distinguished speaker. I think it would be fair to say that the late 18th century founders of Phi Beta Kappa did not envision the study of China emerging as part of the university curriculum in what would later become the United States of America. Certainly the scholars in the China of the Qing Emperor Qianlong in 1776 would not have envied the American system of higher education as fragile and piecemeal and parochial as it was at the time. And as for liberal education, though there was no exact Chinese analog, the Chinese concept of bo xue, of broad learning, the cultivation of the intellect as well as one's moral character, was at least as old as the classical Greek model of learning that Phi Beta Kappa invoked. Of course, the world has changed dramatically since that late 18th century moment, and today the study of China, its language, its culture, history, politics, economy, foreign relations, has become a staple at all of our most prestigious institutions. And it's no longer controversial to suggest that our students, the citizens of the 21st century, need to know something about the country that will play such an important role in the world they are entering and will shape. Professor Shambaugh began his study of China at a time when the People's Republic, at least, 
was very difficult to study, to learn about, to understand, and to predict. And his career has paralleled the slow and then faster and now explosive transformation of China and the Chinese cultural and political spheres. He is recognized as an international authority on Chinese domestic politics, Chinese foreign relations, as well as Chinese military and security issues, all of which are critical concerns for scholars, policymakers, and leaders around the world. He's the single author of six books, the editor of another 16 volumes, the latest of which, Charting China's Future, Domestic and International Challenges, appeared just this summer, and the author of numerous book chapters, articles, and newspaper editorials. Aside from his publications, Professor Shambaugh has also played an active role as an administrator at George Washington and other institutions, has held a number of consultancies with the US government, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and many private corporations. <laughs> his honors and awards are wide ranging and international, including being appointed as an honorary research professor at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a senior Fulbright research scholar at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Institute of World Economics and Politics, just spent there that year last year, and a visiting scholar at institutions in China, Germany, Japan, Hong Kong, Russia, Singapore, and Taiwan. In short, Professor Shambaugh brings to the study of China a perspective that has been sharpened over the decades from many different directions, from observing change at the highest levels of Chinese leadership to the study of greater China as it finds a new place in the world he helps us understand and follow, and perhaps predict, the future of this complex and consequential country. He will share with us today some of these perspectives in a talk entitled, China Goes Global. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor David Shambaugh. All right, sorry about the little technological glitch at the beginning. I was trying to save my battery function. Um, and um, thank you very much for overly generous uh, introduction. Uh, very grateful um, to you, a little embarrassed by it, but much uh, appreciative of the invitation, um, both from UMBC and, and the Phi Beta Kappa Society and, and chapter to be here uh, today in Baltimore. Can you hear me all right? Um, uh, really, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be on the UMBC campus, my first time actually, believe it or not, even though I live uh, just inside the other beltway. Um, and it's a great honor to be selected as a visiting scholar with the Phi Beta Kappa Society uh, this academic year. Uh, and to give my first in a series of these campus visit lectures uh, here at UMBC. Um, so I'm really uh, very, very pleased. I've enjoyed my day here and been impressed very much by uh, those with whom I've spoken, both faculty and students. And I want to thank Professor Vaporis also for your uh, nice hospitality and, and invitation. Um, particularly pleased to know about the new interdisciplinary Asian studies uh, degree program that you have. So I was meeting with some of the students a couple of hours, about an hour ago. Um, um, I observed that this is uh, really, you know, the uh, part of the world to study today. So UMBC is uh, part of the future. It's definitely um, tracking to Asia, and a number, from what I could tell, a number of, of students are um, off to promising careers in, in the field in different different uh, professions. Um, so uh, let me um, talk about China Goes Global, uh, topic of the talk today. Uh, I think it's you know pretty fair to say that China is the world's um, major rising power, or maybe one could say rising major power, or the Chinese would say reviving major power. Um, they don't think of themselves as rising, but returning, in fact, uh, 
some Chinese historians speak of this being the, I think, the fifth uh, rise in China's uh, history. Um, at any rate, China is uh, figuring very prominently in global attention uh, in recent years, and everywhere one turns, you know, China's in the news, either gobbling up resources or soaking up uh, investment from abroad, uh, increasingly investing its own funds abroad. Just today, as the G20 leaders meet in, in southern France, the question is, of course, the uh, sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Um, but another subsidiary question is, to what extent will China uh, contribute to alleviating that sovereign debt crisis? So, so China's financial footprint is not only being felt inside of China's borders, but increasingly outside of China's borders. Um, uh, China has been expanding its profile abroad uh, in recent years in a comprehensive fashion, all, all dimensions, economically, uh, to be sure, um, not just in terms of, of investment, but certainly trade and even aid programs. China has become an oddity, in fact. It is one of the world's largest, if not the largest, uh, it was the largest recipient of foreign aid um, until I think just two or three years ago. Um, but now is, uh, I think, number two in, as a donor country for foreign aid. Uh, not very well known. In fact, the Chinese government doesn't want its people really to know that it's spending their money giving foreign aid abroad because China still claims to be and is, in fact, a developing country to some extent. So um, economically, China uh, is indeed a global economic actor. That's its kind of biggest footprint. Um, we see China's uh, diplomacy increasingly active around the world in virtually all regions. Um, this is new too. You know, China has always been an Asian uh, diplomatic actor, but now we see uh, China very involved in uh, Africa, across the Middle East, in Europe, as I just mentioned, and in Latin America, and of course here with the United States. Um, China is frequently the sought-after partner in what's now known as global governance, a whole range of transnational issues that affect the planet and all of humankind. Everybody wonders, well, what is China going to do uh, to help address uh, these transnational challenges? Um, China's military and its security posture is increasingly uh, robust and modern. China's been on a two-decade-long military modernization program. Uh, which is beginning to really uh, show um, the fruits of, of investment. There you go. Okay. Yep, that's fine, actually. Maybe can you hear me a little better? All right. Um, so uh, we have the Chinese Navy now certainly sailing around the Western Pacific um, in a way they never have, but uh, into other waters as well, into the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf, Gulf of Aden, China's participant in the multilateral um, naval force under UN uh, auspices uh, to fight piracy in the Gulf of Aden. Um, other aspects of the Chinese military modernization I won't go into, um, but include um, certainly air and ground capabilities, but also uh, missile, ballistic, ballistic missile modernization, cruise missile deployments, and uh, cyber. Uh, capabilities. China actually is still, I would argue, a regional, not a global military power, but in two areas it is a global military power, has the potential to be a global military power, ballistic missiles and cyber. In both of these uh, key areas uh, they can reach out and strike anywhere. They could fry your laptop in this room and they could land a warhead in this room if they wanted to. I'm not trying to scare you. But um, uh, the point is, though, that those are two important exceptions to the rule. But the rule is that this is still a military, despite having the world's now second largest military budget, um, second largest naval fleet, largest um, number of, of soldiers and ground forces, increasingly modern air force. Chinese military is modernizing. Don't make any mistake about that. But um, 
It's a long way behind the United States, and it's still a regional military power. Uh, so anyway, um, these are different dimensions of China's going global, if you will. And one, one, asks, one implication of that, actually, uh, is that it has changed the nature of the U.S.-China relationship. That's not the topic of my talk this afternoon, but uh, the U.S.-China relationship has, since President Nixon went to China in 1972, been both a bilateral relationship between our two countries and a regional relationship in the Asia-Pacific region, where we obviously, which we share. Um, but what's new in just the last few years is that it is now a global relationship. And that's because China is now a global actor. I wouldn't call China a global power, however. Um, powers influence events. China is not yet at the point of influencing the outcome of events outside uh, the economic domain and commodity prices. Um, I would argue that even though China's diplomacy is active, it is not influential. You don't see the Chinese out resolving major world issues um, or necessarily even in the middle of major world issues. Um, sometimes they are the major world issue, but they're, in terms of trying to solve them, they're a party uh, to multilateral negotiations on things like Iran, North Korea, Sudan, but they're essentially a passive party. Um, so, you know, they, they're at the table, they're active, but I'm just trying to distinguish activity from influence. Um, and if you read Joseph Nye's most recent book, for example, um, The Paradox of Power, I think it's called, something like that, something about power, not soft power, this is the book after soft power. You know, he really makes the point that power is not the same thing as influence. Um, uh, influence is shaping events. So we don't really see, I would argue, yet uh, in 2011, China out on the world stage actually shaping events. Again, the economic realm is the <coughs> one exception to that rule, um, where it is a larger participant. But it's not really uh, the determining participant of the, inter of the global economy. Um, so the real question, um, you know, you can look at China's global footprint across these different domains, and I didn't mention culture, but that's another important domain. China is now increasingly um, oriented towards trying to project its culture onto the international stage. It has discovered soft power, or it's discovered the issue of soft power, and as I'll talk about in a minute during the talk, uh, is trying to figure it out, trying to figure out what is soft power. Um, do we have it? If we don't have it, where do we get it? How do we get it? Can we buy it? Do you import it? <laughs> How do you, what do you do with it when you get it? Uh, this is a new, just really in the last couple of years, um, or since 2007 really, uh, the whole notion of soft power, public diplomacy is very much on the Chinese government's agenda. In fact, last week uh, they held the sixth plenary session of the 17th Party Central Committee which I'm sure you all followed very carefully. <laughs> but guess what the topic was of the plenary session? This is when the, the country's top leaders get together once a year for a plenary session. Culture. You know, can you imagine the President of the United States and the Congress going off for a retreat? You know, if I'm, first, that, that's a question. <laughs> the answer is no. But if they went off for a retreat, uh, would they kill each other? No. Would they come to agreement? No. But I could assure you they would not be off at a retreat discussing culture and the role of American culture. The Chinese government did that last week. And that just is an indication of the importance that they're now beginning to attach to um, the role of culture in what they call comprehensive national power, Zonghe Guoli. They have always thought of, na of national power, Zonghe Guoli, as um, economic power and what we now call hard power, military power. But they've now begun to discover that image and soft power is uh, increasingly uh, important. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. You can measure, or this afternoon, one can measure all these kind of more empirical dimensions of China's global footprint, statistically or uh, otherwise. But for, you know, I think it's worth our while to 
uh, think a little bit about the more subjective dimensions of China's global posture and, and influence. So um, there's several dimensions. That's going to be the, the subject of the talk. And I'm going to take the prism of perception through which to view um, China's global uh, impact. So a couple ways to do that. First uh, way is how does the world perceive China? So this first slide, if you can read it, which is not easy because there are too many numbers on it, but this is the most recent um, Pew uh, poll, global poll, which they poll in <coughs> 25 countries. You know, and uh, this just was done this summer, and it shows across the world the view that China is going to replace the United States as the world's leading power. It's a remarkable um, unanimity of perception. Um, so the question is not whether, but when China is going to eclipse the United States. Um, even, <laughs> uh, even in the United States, uh, that is the view, according to this poll. Or no, I'm sorry. Well, never. Sorry, not 45% of Americans say no, but nonetheless, there's there's 34% um, say yes. But the rest of these countries all think that China's rise is inexorable and um, significant. Another way to look at it: same polling, but done about a year ago by Pew, um, looks at China's global influence ranked against the other 25. So you find uh, here China in the center, um, you know, mixed, this is an important point, a mixed Im international image. Uh, mainly positive across 25 countries, but significantly 38% negative. So it's neither good nor bad, it's in the middle. Now, I don't know if this one you can see at all, but the main thing is to look at this line right here, the brown one. That's China. What you see since 2005 to 2010 is a steady 20% decline in China's global image across the world. And if you break this slide down, which I don't have, but I can, uh, one finds that decline globally, particularly in Europe. The declining China's image in Europe is up until <laughs> this weekend, maybe, when the Chinese bail Europe out. Um, is, is terrible. It's 70% and above negative. Um, it's 60% and above negative in Asia. Um, it's about 50-50 across the Middle East. It's largely positive but declining in Africa and it's mixed about 50-50 in Latin America. The point here is that um, China's image is mixed globally but has been in steady secular decline for the last five years. So. Um, measured by these uh, surveys, okay. Um, the Chinese are aware of this. Um, they now, as I say, have discovered the importance of international image as part of diplomacy and becoming a major global power. So they're putting a whole lot of effort into Ruan Shirley and Gongo Weijiao, public uh, diplomacy and soft power. So they're doing all kinds of different things to try and advance their country's international image. They're aware that it's not good. It's mixed, it's declining. <coughs> so one of the things they did, for example, last January when their president, Hu Jintao, visited the United States was to take out 24-7 uh, bill billboard time in Times Square and running a series of images about China right in the heart of Manhattan. Um, and if you can see these slides over there, am I in your way? Yeah. Okay. Um, number of other efforts in cultural exchange. Um, you might have heard there was the China, um, what's it called, the uh, China Pavilion Week or something at the Kennedy Center in Washington ran in September, month of September. Uh, really ramped up international exchanges, cultural exchanges, arts exhibitions, dance troops, um, participation in book fairs, not all of which have been positive, like the Frankfurt Book Fair last year. I won't go into that for sake of time, but anyway, the point is that they have been trying to improve their image through media campaigns. And, if, and billboards is one aspect, um, <coughs> cultural exchanges are another, um, 
television. They're trying to, they've now launched a 24-7 news and entertainment channel. Xinhua News Agency has a model kind of on Al Jazeera. Uh, the Chinese Central Television, CCTV, now broadcasts in, I believe, six languages worldwide. China Radio International. Uh, it's not bad. It's improved a lot. Um, they bought airtime now across the United States, including here in Baltimore, I've read. Um, and newspapers, the China Daily, uh, is improved in quality, and it's improved in, uh, it's actually worth reading now. You can learn something from it. But it's also improved in, in distribution. You now find, at least in the streets of Washington, China Daily's being sold right next to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Well, just in the last six months. It's all part of this major 8.7 billion US dollar effort during this current fiscal year by the Chinese government to prove, improve its image worldwide. Okay. But China's image continues to be tainted by several things. Uh, this image um, is the empty chair of the uh, last year's uh, Nobel Peace Prize recipient, Liu Xiaobo, who is serving an 11-year prison sentence in solitary confinement in Liaoning province at the moment for subversion of state power because he had the audacity to uh, circulate, well, to write many things critical of the state, circulate, um, what was that document called? Um, the, after the Prague, um, the Charter, Charter, Charter 2000? Charter 08, that's what it was, Ling Ba, okay. Charter 08. Um, and uh, a number of other things. Anyway, the Chinese government doesn't like him, and uh, they've done with him what they do with many other critics. But um, <coughs> this hasn't exactly helped China's international image. Moreover, China's government reaction to the awarding of the Peace Prize was just completely over the top. Um, they tried to bully and intimidate foreign governments by sending uh, dignitaries and officials and representatives to the award ceremony. So, on the one hand, you've got Times Square. On the other hand, you have the empty chair in Oslo. This is from this summer. Um, the Georgetown uh, Ba Yi China Military National Team basketball game, which broke into a brawl. But if you look at the video footage, uh, it was a one-sided brawl. It's pretty clear. Not initiated by the American side. I'll leave you to your own conclusion. What this shows me, at least, is a very, and I've just come back from living in a year in China, rising nationalism, rising um, anti-foreignism, xenophobia, a real angriness in Chinese society combined with, which we'll see in a minute, um, confidence, overconfidence about China's um, modernization. So uh, these are just some foreign images of, of China. I mean, give you some sense of what the Chinese are trying to do. So what I'd like to do in the rest of the talk is turn it around and talk about China's own image of its own international role, or I should say roles, plural, and images, plural. Uh, there is no single image beyond the image that has existed since the 1870s, not the 1970s, the 1870s, the so-called self-strengthening movement. Uh, that image is known as Fu Chao, to gain wealth and power. That China has been on a singular mission for, uh, for 150 years. Moreover, there's been an assumption there that wealth will bring power, and it does to some extent. China now has wealth. But I would argue, as I said a minute ago, that its power is uneven and that power does not translate into influence. China is still in search of influence. Um, and you can't buy influence. You earn influence. You cannot go to a Walmart of, for soft power, or you can't go to a kind of Walmart of international influence and go to the soft power aisle and purchase it, right? Um, they would like to, and they think that $8.7 billion annual investment by the State Council Information Office is, will help them gain uh, international influence and improve their image. That's a hypothesis that's waiting to be tested. We will see 
if all this investment in these activities actually improves the poles that I just put up there. Um, but they're clearly concerned with it, they're aware of it. So let me turn this around a little bit and for the remainder of the time, um, and I should finish at about, what, five? Something like that? <coughs> take questions. Okay, I'll see if I can compress this a bit. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, talk about the uh, domestic discourse inside of China about their country's international uh, roles. Um, because it's more important to know, I think, about perception rather than about capability. If you're studying international relations, perception is as important, I would argue, if not more important than capability. It determines how countries use capabilities. So it would be nice if we could just sort of say, well, China believes it has a singular view of its role in the world. You know, like the United States, we believe in so-called leadership, right? Um, which I'm not sure is appropriate, but uh, nonetheless, that's sort of locked into the DNA of Americans. The United States has got to be the world's leader, right? Every four years, we have a presidential election. The one thing that <coughs> two candidates from both parties agree on is the United States should be the world's leader. Well, it's not so simple in China. Um, uh, so what I want to give you is um, a sense of what the debates are, because this is new, new stuff for China. China's never been an actor on the world stage before, and being asked by the international community to, to do things, step up and be a global actor. China's always just kind of been looking after itself and maybe being an actor in its own region. Well, now all of a sudden, it's being confronted with a series of of requests, demands, expectations um, from abroad. So this has caused a little bit of cognitive dissonance in China. Um, first of all, officially, the government um, is not comfortable with this notion of being a major global power. In fact, the official rhetoric of the government is they are not a major global power. The official rhetoric is they are a uh, developing socialist country. We're still very poor, right? And China is, you know, still uh, by per capita standards, um, you know, somewhere around number 100 in the world. Um, having lifted 300 million people out of absolute poverty. Uh, so, you know, China's not comfortable cognitively saying that we're a major power. Um, and they're not comfortable cognitively saying that we're a global power. Chinese government officials and intellectuals still think of themselves as a regional Asian power at best. Um, but at least they will admit that. Another very tenacious self-identity in the DNA of Chinese is that of victimization, the historical narrative of victimization that you know, China went through the so-called century or two centuries of shame and humiliation at the hands of the West. This is, uh, as I say, deeply embedded in the DNA, reinforced through official propaganda, through the educational system, and through um, family life. So uh, these are three very tenacious self-identities. We are a developing country, not a wealthy country. We are a, we're a socialist country. Um, we are an Asian power. Um, and we are the victims of uh, imperialism and exploitation. So if, if that's sort of your starting point, and it has been for six decades since the People's Republic of China was established, um, now China's being confronted with all these new um, sort of questions about its global influence. It must be really unusual for Hu Jintao to go to Kent this weekend and be the center of attention about how much he's going to contribute to bailing out Europe. It's hard for the Europeans to think about that, but it must be really hard for Hu Jintao to think about that. But nonetheless, the debate inside China is shifting, is recognizing that China is now increasingly a global power, a major power, um, and the question therefore has become what kind of major global power should China be? So the Chinese have engaged in a very animated, um, very self-conscious internal debate about this subject, more so than any other country in the world, I would argue, um, and certainly more so than any other rising power. This debate has taken place both in elite circles, 
amongst intellectuals, but in society at large, there's a kind of fascination with what it means to be a Dawa, a major power. And you can go into many bookstores in China, and you know the table where they're trying right at the door when you walk in, um, with the hot selling books. <laughs> Interesting. There's juxtaposition. There's one set of books about sort of how to be a major power, sort of how, like cookbooks. You know how how you can you know cook a dish. Well, this is how other major powers become major powers, and this is what you, if you want to be one. This is these are the ingredients, and these are the steps you follow. And the next pile of books next to it is about dissatisfied China, the Bu Gao Xing de Zhongguo, the unhappy China. You know, what's how we've been wronged and how we have to compensate for all the wrongs we've been done. So this interesting kind of uh, popular literature here. But also in the media, there was a very popular television series, 13 part, 12 part, sorry, 12 part Chinese central television CCTV documentary series called Da Guo Jie Qi, the rising powers aired in 2006 originally and then still is being rerun on an annual basis. Hundreds of millions of Chinese have watched this series about former rising powers, how they became rising powers, and then how they declined, and what happened along the way, both on the way up and on the way down. And they've learned one lesson from this series, if you watch the final episode, of what you might call the asymmetry, the asymmetry trap that the inevitably rising powers conflict with the established global power, um, hence the asymmetry of power. And that results in all kinds of tensions, competition, conflict, and indeed uh, war. So they've discovered what many international relations theorists have long known. Um, so this has happened at the popular level. It's happened at the Politburo level. They have had so-called study sessions at the Politburo. Chinese Politburo, by the way, uh, twice a month uh, has retreats. <laughs> and they go off and they study an issue. And they have professors who come in and brief them for two hours. Imagine the leaders of a country getting two hours off. They have to listen to some professors come in and talk to you about whatever subject of the week it is. And then um, the general secretary, Hu Jintao, stands up and summarizes the lecture at the end. Well, they had a number of these on rising powers. Um, so the point is that this is a fixation, national fixation. So within that, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different debated issues that have popped up over time. I'll just run through these very quickly. Uh, the first of which is this saying from Deng Xiaoping in 1989 that in the wake of the collapse of the East European Communist Party states, he made this statement. And this, Soviet Union had not yet collapsed, but China's own June 4th event had taken place. And so the Chinese leadership was feeling rather embattled, shall we say, put it mildly, in the autumn of 1989. And Deng Xiaoping said, comrades, fang qin. Take it easy. We must bide our time, literally, tao guang yang hui, to hide our brightness, which means don't show off. Keep, be modest. Keep a low profile. Uh, don't take the lead. You know, in other words, uh, don't be out in front in world affairs, but do some things. It means do some selective things in international affairs. Well, here we are in 2011, 22 years after Deng Xiaoping made this statement, and 15 years after Deng Xiaoping deceased, and the Chinese are obsessed with this eight-character phrase. They're still discussing it, then uh, trying to figure out whether it is still should be the basis of China's grand strategy. This is the has been the basis of grand strategy. Some are questioning whether China should maintain the low profile and be modest or be more robust and more active. Um, should China bide its time or take advantage of opportunities? Should China take the lead in international affairs or kind of lead from behind or not lead at all? And what things should China do? So there's been a huge debate over this. Uh, secondly, uh, peaceful rise. Um, this comes out of the whole debate about um, what kind of major power to be and the asymmetry trap. And China's been trying to convince the world that its rise will be peaceful. Well, no, that, sorry, 
but that phrase fell out of favor around 2008 and has been replaced by peaceful development, Huping Fajat. Um, so that debate's pretty much over. Uh, thirdly, there's a huge debate about the, what the Chinese call the Guoji Guju, international structure. Chinese international relations uh, community and officials are not just fascinated, they're fixated on structures um, of international affairs. They're always looking for, it's like, like, like they're ge uh, geometrists almost, or geometricians, whatever the word is, looking for you know, triangles, quadrangles, pentangles, nodes, pivots in international relations. They're very structuralist. You know, who, what powers are rising? Which ones are falling? What's the nature they can make? They have all these fancy formulae to measure power. Um, and so they basically came to uh, the consensus that we live, you know, what, and they're very interested in polarity, therefore. How many poles are there in the world? Um, they have been predicting for four decades that the world would become multipolar. They may be actually seeing, their, their predictions may now be um, borne out. Um, but they've been wrong for four decades. So they, they came up with this kind of combined view that the world is what they call each out wuchang, one superpower and many powers. Um, of which China is one. But now, after the global financial crisis, they think that the Yi Chao in the United States is no longer um, a unipolar power. The unipolar moment, as we Americans would call it, is over. And I think they're right there. And so they think that the world has really moved into a multipolar world. The question is, where are the poles? Um, the United States is still one. China is still one. They think Russia is one, or they hope. Russia. They would like Russia to be one. Um, they would, they've given up, frankly, I'll talk about this in a minute, on Europe. Um, they're big believers in, Bra in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Um, so th there's still debate, this is an ongoing debate. I'm sure, not sure it will ever end. Then there's a huge debate that's been ongoing about global governance, multilateralism, and what it means to be a responsible power, the food surrender dagua in Chinese. Um, this phrase was uh, injected into the Chinese lexicon by Robert Zellick, whoever that is, current president of the World Bank, former US Deputy Secretary of State, who in 2005 gave an important speech about um, China becoming a so-called responsible international stakeholder. Um, and the speech argued that China had been a major beneficiary of uh, the international system, and it had been American and Western strategy for several decades to integrate China into the international system. Excuse me. Now, Zelik argued, integration has been accomplished, mission accomplished. Now it's time for China to start giving back to the international system. Stop free riding, stop taking, 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 and start contributing. Contributing proportionate to China's size, wealth, and power was the central argument of Zelik's speech. Well, this tr kicked off a huge debate that is still ongoing in China about whether China should contribute, what it should contribute, where it should contribute it, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me just tag that for the moment. And then there's three other issues that have been debated, or in the case of harmonious world, not really debated, because the term comes from none other than Chinese President Hu Jintao himself, He Xia Shi Jia. So in China, you don't uh, debate what the president says is the policy. So, but uh, one scholar said, well, we don't agree with it, but our way to disagree is not to mention it. So we, we write articles that don't use this terminology, but everywhere else, it's just one is inundated with hushia shurjia. Um, and then soft power, as I mentioned, uh, has become a really hot topic. You can see here uh, the increased number of articles in both academic journals and Chinese newspapers, generally since 2007, and then a big spike in 2008 and a decline that I cannot explain in 2009, sorry, spike in 2008, decline in 2009, 
Um, you know, I haven't updated it since then. But uh, as I say, Chinese are really fascinated by, by it. You know, what is it? Do we have it? Why don't we, if we have it, why don't we have it? How can we get it? Um, are we just, you know, the victims of uh, the Western media bias, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, as I mentioned, they're putting a lot of resources into trying to improve their international image. And then the concept of hegemony um, is always there. It's, uh, it's kind of sine qua non in Chinese foreign policy. So um, the discourse inside China has revolved in recent years around uh, these issues. Now, looked at another way, if those are the issues that are debated, how can you disaggregate the discourse? Um, and here are seven different schools of thought that I uh, see myself in this discourse. Let me walk you briefly through them. Um, and uh, one, one or two things to say at the outset. One is that um, it's very difficult to link individual inst link institutions to schools. In other words, you'd like to be able to say, well, the Chinese foreign ministry is school number four, the Chinese military is school number two, and in fact, the Chinese military is one of the few institutions that you can actually link to a school, and they are school number two, the realists. Um, but it's not so easy. These are views that are held by individuals, and they cross-cut institutions, and they cross-cut generations. Okay, so just get just to bear that in mind as we, as we sort of walk through them. Um, and um, so at the left-hand end of the spectrum, you have what I call uh, the nativists, okay? Uh, this is a um, group, a kind of collectivity of, of populist, uh, highly nationalistic, um, put it mildly, hyper-nationalistic, one might say, xenophobic, and I must say, anti-American uh, ideologues with a strong Marxist tinge still. Marxism may be dead elsewhere in the world, but it is alive and well in China in certain institutions, not in society at large, but certainly in the Communist Party. And they are vociferous critics of the West. Um, they're a very loose coalition. A lot of these people don't even have uh, day jobs. You know, they're kind of self-styled pundits who write um, very, um, you know, write books and articles with very catchy, provocative titles, and they sell very well. Um, they resonate with the public, you know. Um, kind of, I don't know what the uh, analogy would be in this country, Rush Limbaugh or somebody, but um, compared to Rush Limbaugh, these, I mean, he's moderate, in fact, compared to a number of their Chinese counterparts. Um, so they see uh, the main threat to China as coming from the United States and from the West in general. And they think that China never should have opened its door. They, they think that this just brought nothing but capitalism and corrosive social tendencies uh, into the country. Um, and uh, China would be better off if it kind of closed. These are the isolationists that, that closed its doors. And um, went back to more classic uh, state socialism. So they're a minority, to be sure, but they're a vocal minority. Um, and the Tea Party, <laughs> actually, would be the analogy, perhaps, in this country. Um, get back to basics. All right. Next group, re realists. Now, like realists everywhere, I use this word with a capital R as an in international relations theory. Um, they uphold the principle of state sovereignty um, and national strength above all else. That's true of realists everywhere. And they also, like realists elsewhere, see the international environment as very uncertain, uh, very anarchic, very dangerous, and very predatory. Uh, dangerous world out there. So if you're going to go out there, the nativists argue, don't go out there at all. Stay home. <laughs> you know, build your power and close your door. Nativists think, no, no, you've got to go out there, but go out there with a big stick, basically. You go out there with strength. They, they are the Changua faction, Changua Pai. You know, you got to go out there in the world uh, because dangerous predatory world and defend yourself. 
resist outside pressures, deter aggression through strength. All right? We Americans understand this concept, right? You deter aggression through strength. Only that way can China navigate in this inherently um, anarchic world. Um, and therefore, they see the world, and they certainly see the U.S.-China relationship as inherently adversarial and competitive, put it mildly, adversarial. Um, they want China to uh, be a major power. They think China is a major power, and now they argue China should be using its power out in the world. Um, they argue against the um, um, Deng Xiaoping view about hiding, biding time and hiding brightness. They say, no, no, no. We've got to go out and be more proactive, affect, advance our interests through action. Like Madeleine Albright's observation once about the U.S. military when she was trying to get them to go into Bosnia. What good is it to have a big military if you don't use it? Well, these people are saying, with their own People's Liberation Army, what good is it to have if you don't use it? So they're a bit more assertive, shall we say, um, in their views of China's role uh, in the world. Uh, they reject all concepts of globalization, transnational challenges, interdependence. Um, they are very narrowly focused on China, strengthen China, and expand China's power. Uh, and power, in their view, equates with influence. A very hard-headed, realist definition of national interest. They're not alone. American and others, you realists, think in the same way. Then you have the middle, what I call the major powers school. Um, and as the name suggests, this is a group of uh, officials, largely, who um, believe that they're, very pra they're more pragmatic and uh, argue that uh, China's interests are so profoundly affected by the major powers uh, that they have to prioritize the major powers in their diplomacy. Russia, the EU, and above all, the United States. They say, da guo shi shou yao. The major powers are of primary importance. And then they say, the United States is the um, key of the keys. Jung jung jiu jung, something like that. Right? Um, meaning that we are more important than other major powers. And indeed, uh, for the sake of time, uh, they would like, as I said, Russia to be a stronger global power than they are. Um, they had wished for many years that the EU would, would get its act together and act coherently <laughs> and um, assertively on the world stage. Around about 2008, before, long before the sovereign debt crisis, even before the global financial crisis, they gave up on the EU. Long before the Lisbon Treaty, European Europe watchers just became exacerbated with the EU for its inability to act with any coherence and to have any hard power. At the end of the day, Chinese may be fascinated with soft power, but they respect hard power. EU, just the opposite. <laughs> they want soft power and have no hard power. And the Chinese think, therefore, no hard power, um, no respect. So. Uh, that's a group that basically argues for maintaining strong relations with the United States. Then you've got an Asia Firster group. As the name suggests, these are people who argue it's fine to maintain relations with the United States um, and, and may build up your navy or whatever, but we've got to uh, prioritize our neighborhood. If your neighborhood, your Jobian, is not stable, it will it will be, have negative implications for China's economic growth and domestic stability. So we've got to really prioritize our Asian periphery and build good ties with all of our Asian neighbors. This school came into the ascent in 1997 in the wake of the Asian financial crisis. And for 11 years, uh, 12 years, sorry, through to 2009, um, they, uh, China's regional diplomacy, Zhou Bian Waijiao, they call it, uh, was highly successful, I would argue. It, it was a priority, uh, and they turned previously, with the exception of Japan, uh, adversarial relationships around, um, made good with their neighbors, built strong economic linkages, other intercultural linkages, um, and diplomatic, and their diplomacy was quite successful. They had a policy of what they called Mu Lin, Fu Lin, An Lin, good neighborliness, make neighbors prosperous, and make them feel secure. So they were on a roll in their diplomacy for 12 years. 
until 2009. And then they began to aggravate a number of their neighbors for different reasons. It's not like they had a meeting one day and said, okay, let's go out and beat up our neighbors and aggravate our relations with them. But sure enough, one by one, over an 18 month period from the uh, second half of 2009 all the way through 2010, they had problems with South Korea, with Japan, with ASEAN as a group, and a number of the Southeast Asian countries individually, and with India, and with the United States. It was a bad year and a half for Chinese diplomacy. And they, as I say, really aggravated um, their regional relationships and undid 12 years, to some extent, not completely, but they, uh, they certainly undercut 12 years of very uh, good diplomacy. They've got some work to do to patch up their neighborhood. And in fact, since 2011, they, they've looked themselves in the mirror, they realize they've done damage, and they're trying to put right those relationships. They've been much more friendly to their Asian neighbors uh, this year. Then you've got a school called the Global South School. Uh, this is a uh, deep-seated viewpoint in China that we in the West don't pay much of attention to, but it um, goes back to their own, first of all, concept of being a developing, identity of being a developing country, and feeling of fraternity with other developing countries that dates to what is known as the Bandung era, 1955 Indonesia conference, which gave rise to the non-aligned movement. Uh, Chinese have always, Chinese are the ones, by the way, Chairman Mao, who invented the term third world, right? uh, they've always had um, a strong identification with other developing countries because other developing countries not only were poor and developing, but had been the victims of colonialism and imperialism, same as they had been. So kind of philosophical fraternity. Um, so this is not new in Chinese diplomacy. Uh, but has been getting greater emphasis in recent years. You saw it, uh, for example, at the Copenhagen Climate Change Conference uh, a couple years ago. You see it in China's uh, debt relief and aid programs. Uh, you see it in the formation of the BRICS um, grouping, which China initiated, um, and so on. So there is a strong um, sense that China should uh, stand by these countries, but more importantly, um, long-standing view that the international system is unequal and unfair, and that resources and power need to be redistributed from north to south and from west to east. Well, the second half of that is happening now, but they are really trying to change the first half of that, and we're beginning to see that in uh, organizations such as the G20, but in the UN as well. Okay, just uh, last two schools, quickly, and they're kind of siblings of each other, they're not so much distinct from each other. The selective multilateralists, I call them, whoops, and uh, the globalists. These two schools are involved in the debate about what China should be doing in the field of global governance. They, they, they are the ones who pick up Deng Xiaoping's last phrase from Deng Xiaoping, Yo so what should we, should we just be doing some things? which the selective multilateralists, as the name would suggest, do argue. We should be very selective. We should do some things, but only in areas that directly impinge our national interests and our national security interests, North Korea. That's clearly in our national security interests, right on our border. But beyond North Korea um, and East Asia, uh, I think everything is basically not first order priority. So for example, Iran, Iran's nuclear program, uh, Chinese are very, they're not, um, you know, that opposed, I wouldn't, uh, I shouldn't say they're not opposed to the nuclear program. On paper they are, behavior they're not, but they're agnostic, you know, they're, and they're certainly allergic to coercive measures in diplomacy. Sanctions are nothing, are not a tactic in the Chinese diplomatic toolbox. So when the West wants to bring increasingly tougher and tighter sanctions on Iran, or North Korea for that matter, or Sudan, or Zimbabwe, or some other so-called rogue state, the Chinese have an allergy, to put it mildly. Um, but they nonetheless realize, these selective multilateralists, that they can't just free ride uh, anymore, that the international spotlight is on them, 
and they've got to be seen to be doing some things, what Deng Xiaoping said. So to them, multilateralism is a tactic, not a philosophy. So therefore, they contribute to UN peacekeeping, or they advocate contributing to UN peacekeeping operations, the Gulf of Aden anti-piracy operations. They play a role in the Iran uh, 5 plus 1 uh, talks. Uh, they contribute to disaster relief around the world, but, you know, it's really kind of um, pretty weak and fairly feigned. They're not at all comfortable with the whole notion of global governance, first of all, and public goods. Whereas the last group are. These are the John Eikenberries of China. They're small, but they're like the nativists, you know, they're, but un unlike the nativists, they don't, their voice doesn't resonate very much in society. Um, but this is a group of liberal institutionalists, what we would call them in the West. They believe that uh, in interdependence, they believe in transnational issues, that mankind is faced by various problems that transcend sovereignty and borders, and therefore they have to be addressed in a multilateral fashion. Um, and China should be playing a major role uh, in these various global governance issues. So that's the spectrum from left to right. So you have internationalists on the one end, you have isolationists on the other, and a variety in between. Is there, just to conclude, uh, for the sake of time, I could go on a bit, but um, if there, uh, so the point is China is, is a conflicted rising power. There is no singular, single view. There are these uh, multiple, Multiplicity of debates going on and multiple schools, and I would argue that's part of the reason we see multiple and sometimes contradictory actions on the world stage. We see all these things going on. We see China getting selectively engaged in certain issues. Um, we see rhetorically, at least, sometimes some globalist language. Um, we see a lot of South-South uh, cooperation. We see attention to Asia, we see attention to the United States, we see hard power building of the realists, um, and we hear a lot from the nativists. I wouldn't say the nativists have any real influence on policy, um, but they're a loud voice, what the Chinese call Lei Shang Da, Yu Dian Shao, lots of thunder, but little rain. So kind of like, um, but they're loud, so they, their influences Disproportionate. Okay, sorry, this is China model past that. This you can't read, but it's a, it's a slide that sort of shows the intellectual origins of each of these schools, the policy goals, and then the tactics that each of them use. But um, for the sake of time, in fact, it's uh, print is small. I think I'll pass over that. So if you look, then let me just finish on, so, so what? It's nice knowing about the Chinese domestic discourse. What's it mean for us here in Maryland or in the United States? Uh, well, you can locate these schools, I think, on a kind of uh, act, on a matrix um, of pro and anti American and active and passive Chinese diplomacy. So, <laughs> oops, sorry. Oh, I really lost it. Um, Okay, I've also lost the uh, whole picture, but... Um, not the, uh, I don't give a lot of PowerPoint presentations, so bear with me. All right, so, if there is a center of gravity on this spectrum, it's down towards the left-hand end of the spectrum. It's the realists, not surprising. Uh, long tradition in Chinese society, as I say, going back to the self-strengthening movement of the 1870s. Um, um, and these realists are not exactly favorable to the United States. They see the United States as an adversary, or at least a competitor. Uh, and they want to strengthen China's hard power to deal with the United States. And they fear American subversion, what they call hoping yan bian, peaceful evolution. Uh, so I'm not sure we can really, Americans can really work with these people very easily. Who we can work with are the major powers school, and the globalists, and the Asia Firsters. So this is the quadrant where U.S.-China diplomacy intersects in a positive way. This is the quadrant where it uh, 
intersects in a negative way. Why do I put global south there? Because the Chinese really want to empower, redistribute resources and empower developing countries against the north. Take, you know, and that's uh, different than poverty alleviation. We're on different philosophical pages, I think, here. Then you've got um, active anti-US nativists, but as I say, there are lots of thunder and little rain. Voices are loud. And the selective multilateralists are over here. They're basically pro, we can work with them. The US and China can work together on these issues, you know, piracy and Iran, nuclear, and so on. But they're passive. They're not really influential in Chinese diplomacy. So um, it would be interesting, I thought, to do a similar spectrum on American foreign policy. Uh, but that will have to be for another, another visit to UMBC. Just to conclude, collectively then what we find is um, that China's international identity is not fixed. It's hotly contested, very much under debate, very fluid, not static, and a work in progress. Even though there is a kind of center of gravity down towards the left hand end of that spectrum on the realists, there are other schools, and it changes over time, and can be influenced by the behavior of others, including the United States. So how the US behaves towards China can empower one or other of these schools. Right now, China sees the United States behaving in uh, semi-hostile ways towards China, certainly in the military uh, domain. So that strengthens the hand and the voice of the realists. Um, I could go on about that point, and I have uh, one final slide, which, you know, what's this mean for the U.S.? It means that the nativists are deeply hostile to the U.S. We, in the gold of the United States, need to ignore but be aware of them. <laughs> um, realists seek to challenge the United States and strengthen China. So our response has been what we call strategic hedging, to build up alliances uh, and other relationships around China. It's not containment, but it's strategic hedging. Third school major powers, they seek to work with the US, we can work with them, so-called policy of engagement. The Asia Firsters seek to compete with the US and undermine America's presence in Asia. Uh, they see this as their Latin America. It's their backyard. It's not our back, it's our front yard or side yard or whatever. Uh, but we, they do not see the United States as an intrinsic Asian power, the way the United States does. Big difference there. Um, and so their view is to live with the Americans, but the Americans shouldn't really be out here in Asia. And, um, we should sort of uh, work to weaken their presence. Um, that's, by the way, not working, that strategy. The American presence is strengthening, not weakening. In the Global South School, they seek to undermine U.S. and Western dominance, build, build ties with middle powers, and increase uh, U.S. aid and activism in the developing world. Um, that's what we should be doing. We should increase our own activism and aid in the developing world, understand China's agenda there, particularly in Africa, but increasingly in Latin America, too. Um, select the multilateralists, as I argue, they seek to use multilateralism to constrain the United States. They're not wed to multilateralism in a genuine philosophical way. They see it as a tactic to mobilize majorities in the developing world against the U.S. And finally, the globalists, um, we can definitely work with them. We're on the same page, but unfortunately their voices in China have been uh, rather muzzled. So this is a work in progress. It's a conflicted nation. Uh, the internal disc the conflicted internal discourse mirrors is mirrored by conflicted external behavior I would argue um, and we can continue to expect a multiplicity of voices and a multiplicity of policy um, uh, directions from the Chinese government I think on the world stage in the years to come so that is um, sorry I run over time but we still have uh, at least a quarter of an hour for questions. Um, that is uh, one way to look at China's global image. No more slides. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your attention.
because Russia was the more powerful player in the world today. It wasn't about being What would it be? Why, why would that? it? Why is that? Because they would like uh, any power to check uh, the Americans, first of all. They, it could be Russia, it could be Brazil. Uh, they just really uh, don't want a single global hegemon. So part of the answer is they will, they will support any country, any middle power that can uh, maybe individually or collectively with other middle powers check, check the U.S. Secondly, because they have a uh, similar, and Russians have the same worldview, by the way, <laughs> about the U.S., particularly the Putin part of Russia. Um, but they have a greater uh, kind of symmetry of interests on issues of sovereignty, intervention. Um, you find them voting side by side in the UN on a number of resolutions and even vetoing, as you, a couple weeks ago, the Syria resolution together. That was a rather unprecedented act. Um, and uh, they have views about um, alliances in, in common don't believe in them um, and would like to see the Russians, certainly NATO to cease to exist, the Chinese are, would like to see the American alliances in Asia cease to exist. The Chinese argue that alliances are not the way forward to security. They argue that alliances are formed against, alliances are zero sum, they have a certain philosophical way, they, they think they're zero sum um, collectivities of nations against an adversary. So you have to have an adversary to justify the alliance, they say. The Soviet Union had been the adversary, the Soviet Union no longer exists, therefore the alliances that were constructed both in Asia and in Europe against the Soviet Union should, Sidella, should stop to exist. That's their kind of philosophical position. So they believe in what's called cooperative security as distinct from collective security, as do the Russians. Um, and they want to see Russia from uh, kind of falling from losing its uh, kind of global global role. So there's a lot of this, having said that though <laughs> about what they have in common. There's a lot of mutual suspicions uh, between Moscow and Beijing on a number of issues, and that partnership I would argue can only go so far because of historical suspicions, um, which are still pretty deeply rooted. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So what's American's image toward Chinese? So there are several choices. First, just stay there, never change. Second, um, be my partner. We can share things. We can share cake, half and half, and then we can share bad things, half and half. Or just uh, listen to me. When we have the cake, I have the big part, and you have a small part. And or they think uh, Chinese could be the leader. We can listen to Chinese. So what's the American's attitude toward Chinese people? <laughs> I like the metaphor of the cake. Um, <laughs> do Chinese people like to eat cake as much as American people? <laughs> 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 or bian do, maybe, or some sort of <coughs> dofu. Oh, uh, you know, as I showed one slide, the American attitude towards the, well, you use the word Chinese people. We would not distinguish between people and government towards China. Um, and frankly, Americans are very positive towards the Chinese people. Americans are highly ambivalent uh, about and even opposed to the Chinese government. Fair enough. Uh, I think it's fair to say. But the polls show very mixed, as I showed it, 50% more roughly. And th that goes back 20 years. It goes back more than 20 years. The only time was 19, right after 1989 when the negative views spiked for about three years. But then they settled around about 1993, they settled back down. We've been at this kind of 50-50 uh, perception of China, not favorable, not unfavorable, mixed, for, for a quarter of a century now. Um, so there's a lot of respect in the United States for China and what it's accomplished. There's genuinely warm feelings for Chinese people, I think it's fair to say, in the Chinese society. Um, uh, but there's concern about um, what the rise of China means. What does China want? It's part of American's problem. China is not so good at articulating its, uh, its global desires, shall we say. Um, 
and Americans are uncertain about Chinese military uh, intentions and military modernization programs, alliance view about alliances, about the role of the United States in Asia. If China would just come out and say, we welcome the United States in Asia as an Asian power. Have they ever said that? No. Mayo, Mayo eats slip. So, you know, as long as China doesn't welcome the United States in the Asia Pacific region, what should Americans think? We don't say that China is not, doesn't have a rightful place in the Western Pacific. We would welcome, we have said consistently, we welcome a peaceful, prosperous, integrated China in the world. And we mean it. So, you know, we have concerns. Human rights is another concern, um, long standing concern. So, to answer your question, it's mixed. Americans have a mixed view of China, the same way Chinese have a mixed view of the United States, right? You like the American people, but you don't like the American government. Do I have a day? It's hard. So, but, so both countries, the point is both countries have ambivalent perceptions and ambivalent feelings about the other. So in a situation like that, what both countries should do is work to uh, expand the cooperative, positive part of the relationship and shrink and narrow the differences in the competitive part of the relationship. How do you do that? Through dialogue and exchanges, Dwei Hua, and mutual understanding. So I've spent my whole career trying to expand the cooperative part of the relationship and shrink through mutual discussions the competitive part. But it's, I think it's natural. This is not unnatural. You know, China is a rising major power now. It's not un unnatural. So, but what I find unnatural is the Chinese view that, um, you know, China's not believed. China seeks a peaceful, a harmonious world. Why don't you foreigners just believe us, right? <laughs> we all seek a harmonious world, but life is a little more complicated than that. Yes? I can pick up on that. Actually, I was going to ask you your, your take on the China-Japan relationship, which has not been characterized by, by harmony, but the, the Chinese leadership seems to have moved from playing on the Japanese guild with the Nanjing card to right. uh, bullying the government into giving up captains of ships that ran Japanese ships, and then yeah. uh, threatening with the embargo of rare earths. So do you see it much more pugilistic than China in the future? Well, it's uh, all the examples you just gave are examples of why China's image in Japan, at least, if not in the rest of Asia, is not as is not so good. You know, um, now the China-Japan relationship is somewhat unique because of the uh, war and the invasion and the atrocities that Japan committed in China. Um, but. Having said that, uh, China keeps the keeps that alive because it's all part of this narrative of historical uh, victimization. Um, so, you know, the French and the rest of the Europeans aren't keeping alive the narrative of Nazism. They've gotten over it. Um, China, though, it's intrinsic to to Chinese uh, self identity to keep that image alive. I would say so. That's one part of it. Two, they have genuinely, genuine conflicting territorial claims in the East China Sea. Um, I don't, you know, it's going to be a, not a love-hate relationship, it's going to be a uh, difficult relationship between those two countries for some time to come, I think, um, until there is some memory and reconciliation work done and until there is some resolution of the competing uh, territorial uh, claims, but I don't see either of those really on the cards. So, China-Japan relations are going to remain fraught. I'm afraid. Let's come back to this side. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question that Chinese uh, political political system is still like the communist system with one party, and uh, but 30 years ago, Chinese government have adopted like the open and reform policy, have achieved the economic accomplishment. Uh, within these 20 years. Um, I want to know that what the like American government's policy direction to deal with Chinese government that um, just to do doing the business with the, the Chinese and or you will have some influential policy to like the Chinese government to have some transitional change? Well, uh, if I understand your question correctly, I, I think the US government 
uh, accepts the Chinese government uh, as the government of China. So it ex first of all, it accepts reality. It's not wishing for something else. It's dealing with the uh, existing government of the People's Republic of China. Um, uh, we have problems with certain behaviors and policies in China, human rights policies, but also economic policies, internally and externally. Uh, the American government believes that the Chinese market remains closed in many ways. Many, many restrictions on foreign, not just American, but foreign um, investment and behavior in China. Uh, I could give you in, any number of examples, but um, you know, the only way to deal with those problems is again through discussions you know, with the Chinese government. So I wouldn't say that the U.S. is trying to subvert the Chinese government, it's trying to work with, engage, uh, and expand the scope uh, for, um, for engagement and cooperation between the two governments. If you read the statement, the joint statement that was issued in January of this year when Hu Jintao visited Washington, um, it's a very positive uh, 48, 47 point um, vision, not, not just a vision for where to go in the future, but actually a statement of fact about where we are at present. How many different areas, 48 different areas, we cooperate on? This is a very deep, highly institutionalized relationship between the two governments. We have over 60 bilateral dialogue and mecha dialogue mechanisms between the two sides. We're highly interdependent as societies. What I call the two I's, interdependence and institutionalization. Why is that important? Because it buffers the relationship from what is known as the security dilemma, where both sides are very unsure of each other in security terms and are hedging and balancing and counterbalancing. China's balancing and hedging just as much as the US is. Um, and Russia is part of China's balancing act. Uh, but um, other, so there's, there's strategic hedging going on on each side, but there's also engagement going on. So it's a two-level uh, two uh, game between the, between the two governments, anyway. Uh, the, again, the scope is to enlarge the cooperative, or the challenge is to enlarge the cooperative dimension and be sober about the other dimension. You know, we cannot wish away um, the military security uh, dimension. That's a real thing. Um, and that requires transparency and discussion. And so the Chinese military is not exactly what you would call transparent or open to discussion. So it's not easy to engage, for Americans to engage with the People's Liberation Army in a way that we engage with other militaries, including the former Soviet military. So, uh, that's how I'd respond to your question. Maybe we'll go way in the back. Yeah. the way it's viewed abroad, and how this is the biggest sticking point in why so many countries or, and so many peoples have problems with China. I'm wondering why, what is stopping China from, if not, I mean, Tibet seems to be certainly the largest sort of hornet's nest there. It's certainly the one that has all the protests. Clearly China isn't going to just give it up, but why couldn't it uh, institute sort of a one country, two systems, like it, like it has with Hong Kong? I mean, what's stopping it from, from defusing? I'm not quite clear about that. what's stopping China from from from, from diffusing that situation oh. by just oh. granting the Dalai Lama. <laughs> by, by uh, I, well, first of all, I wouldn't uh, overplay the role of human rights in either U.S. relations with China or other countries. It's an important issue, but it's hardly at the top of the agenda. Um, it varies up and down the agenda depending on the administration. It's not unimportant, but it's not uh, front and center. Um, your question of what's stopping China from, well, first I think we have to accept the Chinese government's own um, accomplishments in development, in social development, as a contribution to their nation's human rights. That's the first thing that they, they will say. If you read their own white paper on human rights, they quite rightly say we've lifted 300 million people out of absolute poverty. That is a great human right. We are governing and feeding um, our own population of 1.3 billion. That is the biggest contribution to global governance that we Chinese can make. They're not wrong. Um, and 
compared to the Maoist era, uh, we have a very open society, you know, both electronically and many other ways. People's uh, lifestyles, behavior, what they can read, write, say, how they can gather. I mean, if you'd ever gone to China during the Maoist era or even the post-Mao era compared to today, it's night and day uh, for the better.